this jacket. <clears throat> Gotta really lead with that enthusiasm. This jacket. Rick Owens said he gleefully ripped it off in his fall winter 2011 show. It clearly served as the inspiration for Versace's fall 1992 show, which later went on to inspire Tom Brown's iconic muscle suits in his spring 2015 show. Alexander McQueen, the God, made clear reference to it in his fall 1999 show titled The Overlook. Dries Van Noten did his version recently in his fall 2022 collection. And most of the world has cracked jokes at the expense of Ye's round jacket, which would not exist without this jacket. And even beyond direct references to the shape of this thing, it was adapted by a number of different designers. Like Norma Kamali's sleeping bag coat was legendary in the 1970s. And Martin Margiela continued the theme in the most direct way with his duvet coat in the early 2000s. Have you seen it before? If so, good job. This is the single most influential piece of clothing for this century of fashion, and it was designed in 1937. Do you know who made this jacket? Charles James. You probably haven't heard of him unless you've been to fashion school or unless you're just weirdly obsessed with learning every single fucking thing about fashion, like me. James originally called this the pneumatic jacket, which I guess is kind of like a fashion designer version of a joke uh, because pneumatic tools operate by being filled with air. And this is literally down filled. It has the feathers of the female eider duck inside of it. Charles James always worked directly on the body and he would study body anatomy a lot, especially where it came to movement. He collected a lot of vintage military, vintage for the time, vintage military uniforms and a lot of suits of armor so he could study the articulation points and how those related to how the human body needed to move. So it should be no surprise when I tell you some of the main inspirations for this jacket. The first takes us hundreds of years back to a piece that should be familiar to most fashion historians. It's a piece called the Pourpoint of Charles de Blois. De Blois. De Blois. De Blois. I have a feeling that no matter how I pronounce that, I'm gonna get corrected in the comments, so y'all just go have your fun. This pretty brilliant piece of engineering is from the 14th century. Short explanation is that it allows a lot of range of movement while the garment still appears to be tight to your body. It, it was originally designed for fencing, which is a sport where you have to have every inch of your body completely covered, but you also need complete articulation and full range of mobility for your arms. I know this because I fenced in high school. This design still enjoys a great deal of popularity in LARPing circles the world over. And before anybody starts shitting on this guy, first of all, he did a great job on that piece. He made that himself. Good job, guy. But also, we're a community of people who get really fixative about things like darts and Bratz dolls. Like, I, I will hear none of this making fun of other niche communities of nerds. Shifting gears, we're, we're talking about the points of inspiration for this jacket, right? Another point of inspiration was the first generation of down insulated jackets. It's always hard to say who invented something, but the first patented down jacket in the United States was made by Eddie Bauer of Family Road Trip fame. Kind of a crazy story about this. Eddie Bauer was on an expedition with friends and he almost died of hypothermia and frostbite. He was going up the side of a valley trying to get back to a base camp. It was freezing cold and he shot off a flare because he was collapsing. When one of his friends found him, he said that his shirt, his wool shirt was frozen into a solid sheet of ice that was stuck to his skin. The reason no one would go on these huge expeditions with a serious coat that could keep you warm is because they were just all too heavy. So when he got back and recovered, I, I don't know if you can recover from frostbite. When he felt better, he designed a jacket that was both lightweight, but still able to provide a ton of warmth through down insulation. He called it the Skyliner. That was in 1936. So yeah, the timeline of the Skyliner jacket in 1936 and then this jacket, which was also down insulated in 1937, they're, they're just too close to call it a coincidence. And also Charles James loved keeping up with innovations in fashion and he was obsessed with fashion history and stuff. Like it, it makes perfect sense that he would have heard about the creation of this jacket in the United States. But despite those two pretty clear points of inspiration, there's no appropriative design here. I mean, Charles de Blois was trying to fence better. Eddie Bauer was trying to not die and Charles James had the totally different goal of shitting on haters and lames for the rest of eternity. Someone asked me recently what my job was and I was like, the, the channel, the, this is my job. And he was like, no, I mean like, what's your real job? And I said, respectfully, that my partner and I both put in about 85 hours a piece every week to make this channel happen. I, uh, I do not have another job, folks. So if you value this work, then you should support it! Please. And if you join the 
Patreon right now, you will get the special prize of getting extended episodes, exclusive episodes, full interviews that are uncut with fashion designers, and you get to join the private Discord server. It's a f***ing party. You should do it. I found that I get less of a drop-off rate in certain sections if I just say fuck a whole bunch, so... There you go, you 15 year old. Do it up, back to it. One more point of inspiration was that Elsa Scaparelli had recently introduced shorter fur coats. Uh, we're actually not sure if this one in particular was Elsa Scaparelli, but this gives you the right idea. And also, this is made of monkey fur? Yikes! The evening jacket kind of played with this same general shape, but it was being done with newer tech. It was meant to be kind of a response to Elsa Scaparelli's new bestseller. And around the time that Charles James was working, we were already seeing a movement away from tailoring and towards draping, which was largely spearheaded by the great and powerful Paul Poiret. And the main inspiration for that way of working, moving away from prescribed pattern pieces and more towards this draping idea, was the kimono. Charles James himself was quoted as saying, quote, If I were known for only two things, it would be celebrated displacement of the dart and the wall of air between the fabric. And both of those elements are found in the kimono. There are no darts, and there is a great deal of space between the wearer's body and the garment itself. Where the cloth starts and the skin, there's space. Not to beat it to death, but that does tie us back to the Japanese concept of ma, which is uh, ultimately just the sloppy translation is that it's empty space. Japanese culture has extended this concept into everything from timing to interior design, but in fashion, it just means the distance between your skin and the garment itself. This has come up a lot on the channel. And Someday, some sweet day, we are going to crack that Yoji Yamamoto code. I know. I can feel the answer emerging. So unlike Western clothing at the time, the pattern for the kimono was based largely on the material itself. Western clothes were much more focused on, you know, you're just cutting the thing so that it can go on your body and you can use it as a shirt or as pants or whatever. But the kimono was much more about the celebration of the fabric, being like, oh, this fabric in itself, just as an object, is so beautiful. We need a pattern that emphasizes the beauty of the fabric, but that also can be worn on your body. There's much more reverence for the textile. Why are we talking about kimonos so much? This is about this jacket. That's not a kimono. What? Why? It's really, really hard to put yourself into the mindset of people that were experiencing cultural shifts a long time ago. This influence of the kimono was changing so many things about the way that fashion designers were developing the clothes that they put out into the world that went into high society and that went on to affect everybody else in that society. This piece was being designed at the same time as this huge cultural shift that was being influenced by the kimono. And it's really important. We're gonna stay on it for a second. Hang with me. The way that we get dressed, all of the clothes that we wear now, this is all the result of the kimono and the block pattern that it created. Even really wacky stuff like this. This is essentially the reason that women don't wake up now and put on like petticoats and underskirts and a corset and then other layers. The reason you can wear a button up shirt to your tech job is because of the block pattern tradition that was set in place in the West by the influence of the kimono. I mean, jinkos, kimono. Double monks, you guessed it, it's a kimono. Your iPhone case, kimonos. It's kimonos pretty much all the way down. Always has been. But in the hands of Western capitalists, really the kimono influence just ended up being less about the beauty of the textile and kind of emphasizing that and the ma of the body and stuff. They really just took it to mean like we can make this a lot more efficient if we just use these block pattern pieces. And there was also a lot of need for it. I mean, at the time when this shift was happening, the world was changing in a lot of ways. People's lives were getting much busier, especially women's lives. The Great Depression made it where many women had to go to work for the first time. They didn't have much of a need for these beautiful dresses in the same way that they used to. Now what they really, really needed was they needed practical separates. Again, it's hard to imagine the mentality of people from the past, but that, that really was a revolutionary like engineering marvel. Back to the jacket. This jacket is crazy for lots of reasons. One thing that we have to talk about before we close up is the arms, specifically gussets. The gussets are crucial. In 1975, almost 40 years after this jacket was originally designed, Charles James was kind of reviewing his back catalog and he wrote pretty extensively about how this jacket was designed. And one of the things he specified was that the pattern pieces that went into the sleeves extended in and were the same pattern pieces that went into the front panel of the jacket itself, which would obviously hamper mobility. Also, especially hamper mobility, considering that there are, in some places, there are three full inches. I have tiny fingers, that's three inches. Three full inches of padding in some areas. Thick, look at that. 
chonky, but it didn't hamper mobility. And that, that speaks a lot to the fact that Charles James had this just insistence, this obsession with incorporating the natural shape of a person's body into the clothes that he was designing for them. CJ also wrote that the tapering of the design at the neck and in the underarms made mobility in this jacket possible. But when you combined those elements with a gusset, it enabled the creation of a stuffed section that could move around the front of the jacket and into the sleeves, creating an almost M-like line, like the letter M in the line of the jacket. But when he added in the gusset, that's what really unlocked the full potential of this jacket. And gussets were not even remotely new. They were actually falling out of fashion because it was just cheaper to do clothes that were made with a traditional block pattern that could have higher armholes and stuff. The, the gusset was not a cool thing to use, but Charles James, who obsessively once spent years perfecting a single sleeve on a dress, he decided that gussets were the right move for this particular use case, and he was right. Okay, so that was a lot of technical stuff just now. We're just gonna do a quick review of this. A, a jacket like this is kinda, you look at it and you know, your uncle who's not into fashion would look at that and be like, well, it's just whatever on a jacket. I get just put a bunch of doodads on it, why don't you? And yes, this thing does look like you just added a bunch of frilly crazy stuff to it and called it a jacket. The thing that makes clothing design so incredibly difficult is being able to add in superfluous elements like this, but then also make it a usable function garment and this thing was usable people went dancing in this thing the whole jacket is this incredible monument to compromise in engineering because despite having all of these crazy pieces, a jacket where the pattern pieces are extending from the body out to the arm but also it's three inches and stuff like all that stuff is fine if you're like standing totally still but if you need to be able to move a lot in it being able to make it where all of that can hold together but also be a functional jacket it's it's, it's incredible. This thing is so crazy. And I mean, you'd be surprised. Charles James was not a particularly humble person, but he never really gave himself enough credit for this jacket. He always said this was just a, a fun one-off project that would have absolutely no use in the fashion industry because of how complicated it was in the pattern working phase. Joke's on you, Chuck. This is now a standard assignment in every fashion school. Just recreate this jacket. Charles would be so proud of you when you recreated his jacket for your MA thesis. And changing gears here a little bit, this all comes back to Eiderdown Quilted Comforters, which this jacket is, of course, based off of. And that's really cool because this almost feels like the first found object art style inspiration for someone in the fashion industry. And speaking of which, Salvador Dali, who is a close friend of Charles James, referred to this jacket as the first soft sculpture, which is an actual art term. Soft sculpture as a technique or a practice refers to rebelling against the idea that true sculptures are made of marble or bronze, something that's maximally hard so it could withstand the test of time. But then there were some sculptors who came along and wanted to make their sculptures out of more humble materials. Those were referred to as soft sculptures. Klaus Oldenburg, who's credited with being the originator of the soft sculpture approach in the 1950s, popularized this unique idea of subversive art inspired largely by Marcel Duchamp. And the legacy of soft sculpture as a part of art was sort of started with the use of new and interesting materials. A lot of people credit Merit Oppenheim Heim's object, which is the, the fur breakfast piece, as being a key piece in the evolution of the soft sculpture. Well, guess when object was made? 1936. Guess when this jacket was made? I already told you it's 1937. This jacket, while it was challenging all these previously held notions about fashion dress, almost inadvertently moved away from fashion and into the world of studio art with without even meaning to. And does, I mean, does anyone credit this with being the beginning of the soft sculpture movement? No, nobody really does that. Dali is pretty much the only person who's ever talked about that. But I mean, this wasn't just Dali gassing up his friend. In the same way that soft sculptures are a response to high noble sculpting, this jacket could be seen as a response to high-end noble dressmaking. And what's interesting is that that response wasn't coming from a young rebellious fashion designer who wanted to mess everything up. It was coming from Charles James, who is still heralded as one of the finest couturiers of all time. Unbelievable. And the, I mean, the fact that this thing is still referenced so much today by new designers really cements its place in fashion history. I mean, the only objective measure of quality is influence, and the influence of this jacket is borderline unmeasurable. Thanks so much. If you learned something, go join that Patreon, get on the Discord, talk to other fashion heads about fashion all day long. I love you a lot. I mean it. I'll see you later.